Good afternoon, good evening, good morning. Thanks so much for being with us today. I'm Janice Kamina Resnick, and on behalf of our leadership team, former Congressman Mel Levine, Xavier Oslovsky, Rabbi Ken Chazen, and Caroline Kelly, I'm very pleased to welcome you to tonight's mm -hmm. program. Welcome and thank you to tonight's guests, the remarkable Susan Glasser and our wonderful moderator, Warren Olney. And I will say happy Valentine's Day. Thanks for sharing part of your day with us. Next Wednesday, February 21st, we welcome back to America at a Crossroads, one of the country's preeminent election law and voting rights experts, Rick Hassan. He teaches at UCLA Law and has just published another terrific book about voting rights, A Real Right to Vote, How a Constitutional Amendment Can Safeguard American Democracy. And the email you'll get right after the program tonight, not only can you register for that, but you can see his recent article from The Atlantic, which I don't believe is behind a paywall, so you can all enjoy that, and there's a link to his book. The following week on February 28th, we will dig deeply into politics, right time and right year to do that, with two of the most experienced and respect, respected pundits and analysts, Democrat Bob Shrum and Republican Mike Murphy, in conversation <clears throat> with Pat Morrison. They'll be talking about 2024 election year update. It's anything but business as usual. Links to all of our programs are in the email you'll get right after the program. All of our programs are recorded and you can go to our website, which is JewsUnitedForDemocracy.org or any one of our emails has a link, several links to our past programs. And in order to get a Zoom link for a program, you need to register for the program. Registration links to our next six programs are at the bottom of the email you'll get right after our program tonight. Now, please welcome my colleague, a vital member of our leadership team, former Congressman Mel Levine, who will introduce tonight's guest. Mel? Thanks very much, Janice. It's a real pleasure for me to be able to introduce our guest speaker tonight, uh, Susan Glasser, uh, who is a staff writer uh, for my favorite magazine, New Yorker, uh, where Susan uh, writes the column letter from Biden's Washington. She is the author, along with her husband, New York Times writer, Peter Baker, of three really superb books. I'm gonna identify them all because they are all worth reading. Uh, the first one they wrote in 2005, entitled Kremlin Rising, Vladimir P Putin's Russia and the End of Revolution. And then in 2020, uh, they wrote a book I couldn't put down, uh, The Man Who Changed Washington, uh, The Life and Times of James A. Baker. Uh, and uh, last year, or actually the year before last, 2020, they wrote The Divider, Trump in, in um, the White House. Um, not only is Susan a superb journalist, but journalism defines her and her family. Not only are she and her husband, Peter, uh, two of the most highly respected journalists in DC, but her parents were founders of the Legal Times. And I recently learned that her son, uh, uh, Theo, at the tender age of 18, became the youngest person to receive the highly respected Polk Award for journalism while a young student at Stanford. Um, so it is, uh, it, it, it goes from generation to generation in the Glasser family. I'm also delighted to introduce our moderator, Warren Olney. Um, uh, Warren is, as I think our audience well knows, much honored, highly respected, and extremely talented. Uh, Warren was for decades a regular fixture on Santa Monica Public Radio Station KCRW, hosting both To The Point uh, and Which Way LA, two staples of Southern California NPR uh, shows. Um, our audience by now is probably aware of at least some of Warren's numerous broadcast journalism awards. So I will not detail them except to mention uh, that he remains the only two-time recipient of the Los Angeles Society of Professional Journalists Distinguished uh, Journalism Award. Warren, the floor is yours. Mel, thank you so much. And I uh, appreciate your uh, kind 
uh, uh, remarks. It's always good to be on America at a crossroads. And uh, Susan Glasser, welcome to you. I had the great privilege and and and, uh, uh, and, and enjoyed very much an interview with both you and your husband on the publication of your book, The Divider. So welcome back. It's great to talk to you again. Oh, I'm I'm just delighted to be with you and to be with everyone tonight. Uh, especially grateful that they would take time out of uh, their Valentine's Day uh, to uh, have a conversation, especially because I know not all the subjects we'll be uh, talking about tonight are, uh, you know, a love inspiring, let's just say. <laughs> Probably not very romantic. Uh, 2024 and politics is definitely not for uh, the faint of heart or uh, for romantics, I'm afraid. <laughs> Well, and before we go further, well, uh, congratulations on Theo. That was quite an achievement for a, for a person of that age. And, and uh, obviously, uh, he has the uh, genetics uh, behind him to uh, make a, have a career like you have. Well, uh, listen, he did that all on his own. And, uh, you know, I have to say that it's a great thing to be uh, identified as the mom of uh, uh, your kid. So it's, uh, you know, it's just uh, wonderful to see him thriving at Stanford. Good. Well, our announced topic is, what will 2024 bring our nation and the world? That's about as open a topic discussion as I, as I can think of. But the title of one of your recent columns, it seems to me is a good place to start. And the title is, The Great Washington Meltdown of 2024 Has Begun. So tell us about it. Where did it start? Well, look, I think, you know, this was last week, I was sort of inspired, uh, inspired is probably not the right word, but thinking about uh, this moment in, in our politics, it's not just one of the polarization and gridlock that people here see in the country and internationally, but I think it's a story about kind of the erosion of uh, our institutions and uh, especially the erosion of leadership here in Washington for very different reasons. Uh, you could argue that almost all of our uh, elected institutions are suffering right now from a certain crisis of leadership. Uh, first of all, you have a president running for re-election who has uh, the lowest approval ratings by some metrics of any president since modern polling began going into his re-election. Uh, Biden obviously has achieved a lot as a leader. He has been very successful in passing some aspects of his legislative program. He has, uh, you know, tried to bring the country back in many ways from the, the chaos and disruptions of the Trump years. But it's certainly true that he is not in a, a position that is characterizes strong in any way when it comes to his ability to uh, muscle important priorities through Congress, for example. Right now, uh, President Biden promised the world that he would be standing by Ukraine as long as it takes. And it's 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 not at all clear that the United States or that the president can actually follow through in that word. So you have a crisis of leadership in the presidency. You have in the Senate, the very visible erosion of authority of Mitch McConnell, who a year ago became the longest serving party leader in congressional history, uh, but now is very clearly no longer able to muster the, the full force and devotion of uh, a united Republican conference behind him. Uh, and, you know, Chuck Schumer has been more successful with Democrats, but at the same time, it's almost a 50-50 Senate still. And then, of course, you have the House of Representatives, which almost is the very definition of a leadership crisis. Uh, and uh, if for the first time, in fact, in American history, Republicans dumped uh, a speaker of their own party in the middle of a term, and they've settled upon uh, uh, basically a complete unknown who is really very visibly struggling day in and day out in the job. Struggling uh, with a uh, Republican majority that has now been reduced by one after the uh, election last night, a uh, special election in New York about uh, to replace uh, the Congressman uh, Santos, uh, who was unceremoniously removed from the, uh, or I suppose he was ceremoniously re removed <laughs> right. from the uh, uh, from the Congress. So it's going to be even harder for him. He's going to need more people to come in from the hospital and cast a vote. Uh, well, that's right. Basically, you're looking at at the moment uh, until there's a special election in California uh, later this spring to uh, succeed Kevin McCarthy. You're looking at 
the speaker only being able to lose two votes at any given moment. And of course, it was just a handful of Republicans who were able to band together and topple Kevin McCarthy in part because of concessions that he made to get the job of speaker in the first place. So you basically have the inmates kind of running the asylum on the Republican side of Congress right now. What it means is they're routinely things that would have been unthinkable. When I was a young reporter covering Congress, the idea that the uh, Speaker of the House would not be in full control of the Rules Committee, for example, that they could routinely bring uh, important pieces of legislation to the floor and not know the outcome of the vote in advance, the, these would have been unthinkable Things you know, whether Democrat or Republican, basically uh, uh, the House is now in a, in an almost ungovernable state, and I think that's likely to be true for the remainder of this year until we see what the election brings in terms of a new Congress. So it's 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 a moment of great dysfunction, and you have a situation that uh, is such that basically the Speaker of the House is so captive to any small, loud faction, he's refusing to bring bills to the floor that a clear majority of Congress, even a large majority of Congress would support, such as uh, aid for Ukraine. Well, let's talk a bit about aid for Ukraine and what happened in the Senate, where uh, it appeared that uh, it was there was something happening. It was, of course, linked to the border uh, issue and uh, Republicans negotiated it. Uh, the senator from Oklahoma, uh, particularly, uh, deeply involved, terribly offended when ultimately it didn't happen. But that was because of another kind of leadership, which was apparently Donald Trump. <laughs> well, that's a different kind of leadership. We haven't talked about that. I don't know if you would call that leadership. Uh, uh, well, uh, but it, he got him to do what he wanted. He is he is asserting in every way possible right now his continued dominance over the Republican Party. And we have seen that certainly for quite some time in the House. In fact, Donald Trump was the kingmaker who made the unknown Mike Johnson speaker. Uh, he was the one who sank the very short-lived candidacy of Tom Emmer, the uh, Republican whip in, in the House who wanted to become speaker. A majority of his colleagues voted for him. And Donald Trump said, no way, by the way, because his litmus test is, did you support my lies about the 2020 election? And Tom Emmer was one of the rare Republicans in the House Republican Conference who didn't uh, uh, go along with Donald Trump's election denialism. And that was enough for him to lose out his chance on the speakership. So fast forward, Donald Trump basically uh, has no bigger remaining enemy in today's Republican Party than Mitch McConnell, the Senate Republican leader. And that's part of McConnell's crisis of leadership. Republicans, elected Republicans, they are looking at where their party's electorate is. They're seeing Donald Trump, despite uh, 91 felony counts and four different criminal cases against him, despite uh, uh, the, the disgrace of how his presidency ended, running away with a Republican nomination and Republican senators in increasing numbers uh, have endorsed Donald Trump and are refusing to go along with McConnell. McConnell appoints Jim Langford. You mentioned he's the conservative Oklahoma senator who was appointed by McConnell to negotiate uh, basically uh, a grand bargain with Democrats where there would be border concessions by Democrats in exchange for Republicans going along with the nearly $60 billion in additional assistance that President Biden has asked for on behalf of Ukraine. Uh, this was the Republicans' own demand. And we're now in such a, a circular, uh, almost crazy situation where Republicans demanded that Democrats make concessions and make a deal. Democrats did that negotiating in good faith. And then Republicans said, oh, never mind. Our leader, Donald Trump, says we can't support it anyways. And so here the matter lies, basically. How do you explain how this happens, particularly with senators like uh, Lindsey Graham and Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz, all of whom uh, ran for president or thought about running for president in uh, 2016, uh, and not, and and denounced Donald Trump in the most uh, in some cases uh, really uh, very strong terms. Let's put, put it that way. Uh, and here they are going back and forth on this bill uh, because Trump tells them to do it. Well, that's right. Uh, they with strong terms. Lindsey Graham uh, uh, called Donald Trump a kook 
Uh, well, yeah. who looks kooky now? Lindsey Graham looks pretty kooky. Uh, after the Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2022, Lindsey Graham was pounding on his chest, uh, uh, criticizing President Biden for not doing enough for Ukraine, uh, bragging about how uh, he was willing to stand up to the Russians. And, you know, flash forward to this week, Lindsey Graham didn't even vote for the bill in the end. Uh, and, you know, look, we're eight years in to the Trump phenomenon. So, you know, I, I, I wish I had a better explanation still for this uh, extraordinary and almost just, I still find it cringe worthy phenomenon of uh, these grown men uh, willing to abase themselves and humiliate themselves in public uh, at the altar of Donald Trump. We saw another example of that in their Senate colleague, Tim Scott, uh, who ran a very uh, short and notably unsuccessful presidential campaign this year for the Republican nomination that culminated with him both dropping out, endorsing Trump, and standing there behind him on the stage, uh, you know, basically, you know, looking for a pat on the head uh, from, from his, you know, new uh, king, same as the old king. Right, it's 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 an amazing spectacle. It's one that's important for people not to avert their gaze from. But I totally understand <laughs> when they do because I still find it extremely cringeworthy. Well, the crowds of senator of senators and uh, uh, Congress members uh, who uh, are doing exactly the same thing, and are they all just afraid of being primaried? Is that is that what it's about? Well, I mean, you know, look, there are different reasons uh, uh, one do, does something like this, I suppose, in politics. First of all, attracts a certain personality type to begin with. Second of all, I, I do think you're in a situation where re Republican elected officials, many of them, certainly at the national, at the federal level, uh, believe that they are trapped by their own electorate to a certain extent, and that the electorate has refused to let Trump go, and therefore, what choice do they have? And, you know, of course, uh, when they're speaking off the record or to each other, they have a very different view. Many of them are yeah. well aware, of course, of Donald Trump's many flaws, uh, both as a person, uh, as a president, uh, as, a, as a candidate. Uh, many of them do hold him personally responsible in private uh, for putting their own lives in jeopardy, which he did on January 6th of 2021. And yet, uh, you know, I've heard senators uh, give uh, different explanations to me. For example, one of them said, listen, what am I supposed to do? Uh, my own voters are far more uh, uh, enamored of Donald Trump than they are of me. Uh, Donald Trump outpolls me by 20 points in my own state. And so there's this uh, weird, almost reverse dynamic where the um, uh, the elected officials are essentially afraid of their own electorate. So that, that I think does drive part of it. Of course, yeah. there's also things like sheer ambition uh, 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 that also drive it. For example, Marco Rubio to me is one um, uh, really notable uh, uh, person who in 2016 ran against Trump, criticized him, ran as sort of the national security kind of hawkish traditionalist Republican in that race. He also voted against Ukraine aid this week and is reported to be trying out for a slot as Donald Trump's vice president. By the way, I don't think he'll get it. And the reason why is because Marco Rubio did not go along with the 2020 election lies. And, and Donald Trump has made that a pretty clear lit, litmus test uh, for himself. Let's talk a bit about the world. Uh, we are we're supposed to talk about what uh, 2024 will bring to our nation and the world. And uh, we're getting close to it when we talk about what happened with regard to the uh, uh, Ukraine uh, and Israel and uh, uh, Taiwan bill that uh, failed so ignominiously uh, attached to the border bill as it was. Um, what about what Trump said about NATO? The president or former president of the United States saying that uh, he had told NATO leaders that uh, if they didn't pay up, as he put it, um, it would be okay with him if Russia did whatever the hell it wanted to. Um, we don't know if he really did that or really said that, but he certainly said it out loud now. And uh, that's gotta have an immense impact, it would seem to me, uh, on the, uh, the countries in NATO. Uh, and uh, it kind of shakes the idea of the whole uh, alliance uh, strategy uh, for having a national security. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is one of the clearest differences that you could imagine between obviously President Biden and President yeah. Trump. It's also something that is both shocking and also I would say not surprising coming from Donald Trump. If you look at his record, uh, when Peter and I were doing our reporting and research for the divider, it was very clear to us that Trump's animus toward NATO uh, not only would continue, but that he considered it to be a kind of a frustrating aspect of unfinished business from his first term in office. Uh, John Bolton, his uh, third national security advisor, uh, who, like many others, broke publicly with, with Trump, has been out there saying that if Trump is elected to another term in office, that he believes that he will move to withdraw from NATO. These uh, Republican senators, by the way, many of whom are endorsing Donald Trump, are so concerned uh, about NATO that they joined with their Democratic counterparts earlier this year and passed a provision to the defense bill uh, that makes it, uh, uh, that forbids a president from unilaterally uh, withdrawing from NATO and requires an affirmative vote of Congress in order for that to happen. That's an effort to constrain uh, a possible Trump second term. But to be honest, I don't think it's sufficient. And, and, and the reason is that Article 5 of NATO, which is the key provision, that's the mutual defense uh, uh, provision that is at the heart of the alliance, that relies upon the, the, the good word uh, and the public faith uh, the, in the participants that it will be honored. And Donald Trump, it seems to me, even without legally withdrawing from NATO, can essentially undermine uh, the premise of mutual defense that is at the heart of the alliance. And I believe that he has already done so. And were he to come to power, uh, there is no question in my mind that Putin would see this as an enormous opportunity for him, uh, that it would be uh, a victory for those not only who don't want Ukraine to prevail in its existential fight with Russia, but that would pose a direct and concrete threat to uh, many of the NATO members who were part of the Soviet Union at different times. Obviously, there's the three Baltic states. There's uh, now Finland that shares an enormous border with Russia. Uh, there's Poland, uh, which you know has had a long history of dealing with aggression from the Russian Empire. I recently met the Finnish ambassador, by the way, here in Washington. Uh, and he said to me, do you know how many wars my fun my country has fought with Russia? And this was at a, a, a lunch with a number of other Nordic ambassadors. No one knew the number. He said, 49. Finland has fought 49 wars with Russia. And this is why we have joined NATO now. I want to ask you about uh, Vladimir Putin's comments in his interview with Tucker Carlson, where he started talking about po uh, Poland and how he blamed Poland uh, for World War II, said that uh, Hitler didn't have any choice except to invade uh, Poland. Uh, that must uh, put the scare in everybody in, uh, uh, in the NATO alliance. And of course, it was only after that, uh, just I don't know if it was coincident or not, that uh, Trump once again uh, launched this attack on NATO. I thought that was really one of the more breathtaking parts of this interview. You know, clearly yeah. uh, Putin has had his rant about Ukraine for quite some time because uh, the, these are the things that he's been saying ever since he uh, unilaterally launched a war of aggression on his neighbor. But to me, it, it, it was amazing to hear Putin blaming Putin, uh, sorry, blaming Poland for uh, essentially being the cause of Nazi Germany invading it. <laughs> this yeah. was a shocking statement. And, um, you know, obviously not only bastardized history, but uh, very dangerous. Uh, this is the kind of rationalization uh, uh, that one might expect to hear from a volatile dictator uh, who is in, desiring to invade others of, his, uh, others of his neighbors. And I thought it was very worrisome uh, and, uh, just astonishing, especially at a moment when Poland and other NATO allies of ours in Eastern Europe are so concerned. There was a report just the other day uh, uh, from some of our NATO allies that concluded that there is a realistic military threat from Russia to the alliance in the next three to five years. This is really, in, in, in military terms, uh, that is 
just around the corner. And um, not only are we not acting to counter that, but right now uh, we are failing to live up to the commitments that have been made by the president of the United States to our allies and in a way uh, that is extremely damaging, it seems to me. And if Putin were to overtake Ukraine or win in some con in some context there or some, by somebody's definition, his particularly, um, wouldn't that move things along in terms of the uh, uh, threat to NATO? Absolutely. Uh, you know, look, we're in a situation because we have one of our two candidates right now, Donald Trump, is essentially pro-Putin. He's pro-Russia. That has given Putin every incentive to continue this war at least until November to see if uh, you know he might get a guy in the White House who would essentially pull the plug on Ukraine. What Republicans in Congress are doing is simply accelerating that timetable in a way that is remarkable because actually Putin arguably had already lost. Putin suffered an incredible embarrassment and defeat when his initial lightning blitzkrieg plan mm -hmm. to topple the government in Kiev, Kiev failed. That was an incredible defeat. And Ukraine in the subsequent year and a half essentially managed to hold off a much stronger, wealthier, larger neighbor and, and fight them to an impasse, largely thanks to the military assistance and support provided by the United States and our allies. Right now, we are already causing that uh, delicate standoff to uh, possibly collapse at the, at the expense of Ukraine. There are credible reports from the field right now that Ukrainian units that are fighting Russians on the front line do not have the ammunition that they need to hold their defensive positions. And that is a direct consequence of some Republicans who watched Donald Trump on television and decided to somehow link the fate of Ukraine to a, a, a political fight in an election year over our border here in the United States. It's it's really, it's it's one of the most astonishing foreign policy own goals uh, I've seen in a long time in the US. And when you go back to uh, Trump supporting uh, Putin, uh, you go back to the Mueller report and what it really said, contrary to how it was re uh, reported at the time, uh, first by the attorney general and then uh, by the press. Well, let's go back to the situation here in this country because we need to know what uh, 2024 is bringing us as well, more locally. Uh, and the issue of the border, um, President Bush, excuse me, President Biden uh, said initially that he would not only support the uh, uh, deal that was worked out by, in a bipartisan way in the Senate, but that he'd close the border if he had to under certain circumstances. That uh, really got him in trouble with a lot of people in his own party. And then last night we saw in New York City uh, the uh, uh, victory of the um, man whose name escapes me for the moment. Um, and uh, yeah. thank you. And uh, uh, he brought, ran essentially on an anti-border uh, or, or, or an anti-Biden border uh, campaign. He didn't want Biden to come into his district and campaign for him. Uh, is it likely that the Democrats will be able to somehow pivot on the border issue? After all, uh, the Republicans used to be all in favor of having open border, borders. Well, look, I would say a couple of things. First of all, of course, this is all about Donald Trump wanting to have an issue to run on. And he believes that uh, immigration and his demagoguing on the subject was a reason that he won his unlikely upset victory back in 2016. He sees it as the, a key issue that motivates his followers to come to the polls. He has no desire uh, to uh, hand uh, President Biden any kind of a win on this issue uh, that he can use to undercut Trump in the election year. So I think that's what was driving the recent collapse of the border negotiations in the Senate. At the same time, it because it was so kind of flagrantly political and hypocritical, uh, in a way, it gave Biden and Democrats something to talk about, which they didn't have otherwise. You know, I've been struck in recent months that even many Democrats uh, have come to believe that Biden 
uh, and the White House screwed up uh, that that by sort of not wanting to engage on the border and on immigration, seeing that as uh, an issue for Republicans and their demagoguing, uh, uh, that they allowed uh, a problem to sort of get out of control without being willing to uh, expend political capital to address it before it came uh, to being all wrapped up in the election year. And, you know, of course, one of the things that you saw Republican governors like Ron DeSantis, like Governor Abbott in Texas doing, uh, you know, that actually I think was successful politically. It was a stunt. It was terrible. It was playing uh, with people's lives. But by sending large numbers of migrants to uh, Democratic run cities in the North and the Midwest, uh, they essentially exported the politics of immigration and the border to some democratic states as well. And you started to hear complaints uh, here in Washington from uh, democratic governors, democratic mayors, pressuring the White House and Biden to do something more and not let this get out of control. So, you know, are the voters going to buy the idea that it's uh, 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 it's Trump's fault uh, that we have a border crisis because uh, he refused to allow this bill to pass. I don't know. I don't know how much voters are really paying attention uh, to machinations in Congress and to bills that don't pass in Congress. What do they know? They know that Donald Trump is the guy who talks tough all the time about the border. And by the and the other thing I would flag for the listeners today is that some of the things that Trump is talking about doing uh, if he comes back to the White House are things that uh, even his own advisors deem to be flagrantly illegal in his first term in office. Uh, Trump wanted to do many different uh, things that he's talking about doing now, such as ending birthright citizenship, such as uh, uh, rounding up migrants and essentially putting them in gigantic camps. Uh, you know, he's he's now talking in his rallies about, you know, the, the arrests will begin, the deportations will begin at noon on January 20th. Uh, you know, these are measures that certainly will be challenged in the courts uh, if he comes back to office. But he's basically talking about uh, uh, taking it up a notch and fulfilling kind of uh, his most hardline advisors like Stephen Miller, uh, all of the wish list of things that they didn't get done in Trump's first term in office. On the critical issue, of course, uh, on behalf of uh, Biden is the claim that uh, there are things that the president can't do. But, uh, Trump says he can, but in fact, uh, the Biden people insert, assert that he cannot. Uh, there's that. And there's also the fact that uh, there's a real understaffing of the border patrol and the border agents that uh, deal with the uh, uh, court cases that have to be uh, con conducted and so on. And that it would take an act of Congress, as I understand it, uh, to increase that staff. Exactly. And by the way, that's what was in the border deal. Yeah. That Republicans agreed with Democrats and then withdrew their support from. So, you know, Democrats and Biden have now an issue to run on. They can say, and they can legitimately say, we were prepared to vote for a deal that would fund these agencies in order to take steps that we have not been able to take in order to make sure uh, that more people were not just being released uh, into the U.S. population, you know, that we had the facilities and the judges and the uh, beds in order to make this system work better than it has been working. We'll see uh, if people buy it. I suspect that it remains, as so many of our issues do, uh, a tale of two different parties, a tale of two different realities. Uh, and, you know, Republicans will talk about their immigration reality, uh, which is that there's an invasion at our southern border and that it's all Joe Biden's fault. Uh, Democrats will say, well, re Republicans are hypocrites and they don't actually want to solve this. They just want to scare their voters with it. We'll see. We'll see who uh, who has the, the more convincing argument. When you talk about the uh, destruction of institutions, as you did at the beginning of the program, I'm reminded uh, that uh, Congress has some work to do. There are deadlines, are there not, uh, for funding bills in order to keep the government running, something that you would think that uh, everybody who's elected to Congress or the Senate would want to do. Uh, obviously, in the past, they had allowed there to be pauses in the uh, fun funding of the uh, government, but we haven't heard much about that lately. It's going to come up in a big way very soon. 
Absolutely. Uh, and this is another uh, thing where uh, if you care about uh, uh, the U.S.'s credibility in the world and its continuity, it, the weakness, the incredible weakness of Speaker Johnson is something to worry about. Uh, it, you know, He set up a situation basically where he kicked the can down the road uh, right when he came into office. They postponed the deadline again for getting their work done and just put in a couple of different short-term continuing resolutions is what they're called. Uh, and uh, in just a few weeks from now, I think it's March 11th, you have the first of these deadlines. I would not rule out uh, a shutdown uh, of unknown duration, if only because this Republican majority isn't really a majority at all. And you have uh, essentially the, the hardline, uh, hard right freedom caucus, which is basically against anything that smacks of governing, is, is against funding the government, uh, is going to um, pressure and pressure and pressure Johnson. And so with that dynamic in place and Republicans only being able to lose two of their members uh, in order to hold on to their majority, you know, it's 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 not a recipe for responsible governance. Uh, now, that being said, I think they're probably also afraid in an election year of uh, being blamed for some kind of catastrophic shutdown of the government. So maybe that will be enough to get it through. Let me go to chat and some of the questions that are coming from our viewers. And uh, uh, they're certainly interesting and important questions. Um, Donna wants to know, what role do you think the media is playing in Biden's polling? Uh, do you think they're trying so hard to seem fair that they're unable to rise to meet our current precarious situation? Well, uh, look, you know, uh, all the institutions in our society, including the media, uh, these days uh, have suffered greatly in terms of the public esteem. Uh, and, you know, I think it's one of the consequences of the, the fragmenting of the media marketplace is that there are so many more actors, it's very hard uh, to really understand. In fact, who are we talking about when we talk about the media? There's been an explosion in the number of different ways in which people get their news and information. Uh, and that ranges from uh, the traditional and responsible uh, to, you know, who knows where many young Americans get their news from, from quick snippets on TikTok. Uh, and so, um, you know, unfortunately, it's, uh, it's I think, aggravated uh, uh, the the decibel noise in our uh, politics, and it's it's made it harder and harder and harder for people to break through with uh, facts, with independent reporting. Uh, everything uh, is aggressively litigated now by partisans in the court of public opinion. Uh, and uh, you know, I, my basic view on this, uh, which people may or may not agree with is that uh, in the end, Biden's uh, unpopularity is a reflection of uh, genuine concerns that uh, Democrats and independents, uh, many of whom uh, would be open to voting for a Democrat, have about the president uh, serving another term in office. I don't think it's because they don't like him. Uh, you know, unfortunately, that scathing phrase that we all heard the other day from the uh, special counsel's report uh, where he, he termed the president a, a well-meaning elderly gentleman with a poor memory. Uh, I think this probably jibes with the view of many Americans. Biden is already the oldest president in American history uh, at 81 years old, and he is seeking a second term in office at the end of which he would be 86 years old. Uh, and of course, uh, this is going to be an issue of concern to voters. Are we able to walk and chew gum as human beings? Uh, you know, I think our minds can uh, understand that uh, it's not the same thing as Donald Trump, who both has the age issue and uh, very, very serious questions about his judgment, uh, his uh, ability uh, to be honest, his ability to process information, uh, and, you know, some of the dangerousness of the underlying ideas and policies that he advocates. So, you know, it's a really hard thing. I understand the tendency uh, to want to say it's the media, it's the media. But I think that, you know, Americans are also making their own conclusions as they observe their president. And uh, they have legitimate questions at this point about whether he is up to the job of seeking a second term.
I don't want to make you repeat yourself, but David asks this, isn't the media complicit by promoting false equivalencies like the intense focus on Deb Biden's memory after the Her report, Her being, of course, the special prosecutor in that case, and undermining Trump's cognitive incapacities, thus implying a false equivalent uh, reminiscent of Hillary's emails? Well, look, uh, it's it's not, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, in my mind, these aren't equivalent problems. Uh, but anyone who doesn't think that Biden has a challenge with voters, remember, these polls are not showing that Republicans don't like Biden. They already didn't like Biden. These are polls that are showing that Democrats and independents uh, are concerned about their guy. Uh, and uh, I think that exists for people in their in their minds quite separate to their concerns. In fact, the premise, as I understand it, of the Biden campaign as it seeks uh, to get the president reelected is that these numbers are going to change when voters realize that it's not a referendum on the president, that it's a choice between two uh, individuals. Uh, probably most voters can agree on one thing is that it's not their optimal choice that most Americans, regardless of party right now, say they really would rather that it not be uh, uh, two uh, uh, octogenarians, that it would rather not be uh, Joe Biden and Donald Trump. But nonetheless, that's the choice we're facing. And the Biden campaign, what they would say is in that uh, uh, choice, if it boils down to Biden's age versus Trump, who has age and uh, you know, uh, a level of, you know, sort of uh, manic recklessness uh, with uh, with the country and his approach to the presidency that they believe Americans will will overcome their qualms about Biden and, and go in that direction. That's a reasonable theory of the case. But I have to say it would not be responsible. It would not be responsible for the media not to be aggressively reporting on this subject. Uh, if Donald Trump didn't exist, uh, it would be an important subject for uh, journalists who have to be independent and not partisans. It would be an important subject to try to understand uh, the fitness for office uh, and uh, issues. And if a uh, 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 an independent prosecutor appointed by the president's own attorney general comes back with a public report that says this. I, you know, I would just ask you: Do you think that you know journalists are not supposed to to cover that? Uh, we wouldn't be doing our job uh, if we didn't ask these questions. I don't want to go any further with this, but uh, the argument against it, or, or one argument, would be there was so much emphasis on what Heard said that he wasn't supposed to say about uh, Biden's uh, uh, personal. Uh, situation. Uh, apparently, uh, people in that position uh, aren't supposed to do that. If they say that somebody isn't going to be prosecuted, they're not supposed to say things that uh, will do damage to them. And there was certainly, on the part of the media, more coverage, I would think, of uh, the fact that, uh, that uh, of what he said about uh, memory and old men and so on, uh, than there was about uh, Biden's uh, guilt or innocence. And uh, not much was said about the fact that uh, Biden, in fact, did uh, report uh, uh, to his ghostwriter uh, what it said in one of those documentaries, which is uh, one of those documents, rather, uh, which is something they're not supposed to do. But let me go, go to Eric, who says, what do you think of Trump's position on the Israel-Hamas war? He hasn't spoken much about this. You know, I thank you for bringing that up, Eric. Uh, I do think it's very interesting. Uh, you know, Trump, when he was president, uh, uh, you know, was very uh, close uh, to Prime Minister Netanyahu in Israel. He worked uh, uh, through his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, on the Abraham Accords and essentially, in some ways, you know, almost outsourced uh, uh, American policy uh, to the Israeli government uh, and uh, took a very hard line on the Palestinians, cut off uh, uh, assistance to the Palestinian Authority, uh, essentially bought into Netanyahu's um, theory of the case that you could make peace uh, uh, between Israel and the surrounding Arab nations while essentially bypassing the issue of the Palestinian uh, people. Now, we've seen in a tragic way since October 7th that that uh, was a deeply flawed and wrongheaded uh, theory of the case. 
uh, and you know that that just uh, you know has exploded in in a in a terribly tragic way. But interestingly, Trump hasn't said that much, and that's partially I I believe because people had not focused on the kind of uh, bitter ending of the Trump Netanyahu bromance uh, when Trump was in in the White House. We have a chapter in our book, The Divider, that looks at that. And uh, because it, it, it came out after Trump was already left office, I don't think people fully appreciated how, uh, you know, Donald Trump had soured personally on Netanyahu. He believed that Netanyahu had come to the White House in his final year and essentially uh, tried to upstage Trump on his own platform at the White House, which, as we all know, uh, you know, <laughs> if there's anything Donald Trump doesn't like, it's uh, to feel upstaged by anybody or that they're not personally loyal or personally grateful to him. Uh, he's, in fact, said a couple times recently he's made bitter comments about Netanyahu and claimed falsely, as far as uh, I can tell, that uh, Netanyahu was supporting his strike on uh, uh, Soleimani, uh, the Iranian commander, uh, and then withdrew support for it a, a few days before it happened. There's no evidence that that's true, but it's fascinating to me that Trump has been saying it. Uh, so, you know, basically, it's, it's an interesting question, as we all know, uh, for Republicans in recent years, uh, almost reflexive support for Israel has become the norm, and it may well be that Trump uh, just does not want to poke, uh, uh, you know, his his own electorate and his own party too much on this one. Pretty good book, The Divider. A lot of stuff in there that uh, helps uh, to understand what's going on today. Ruth and Nancy uh, have a question which contains information that I have not heard before. Uh, so let me just say that with that. Uh, in mind, please address the news today that Putin has a new nuclear plan in his arsenal in the use of satellites in space. While reports are saying that there's no imminent threat, what are the chances that Putin will accelerate development and think nothing of starting a nuclear war in the foreseeable future? And will this information shake up some in the Trump supporting members of Congress? A lot of stuff in there. There is a lot of stuff in there. I would say that, you know, first of all, we're, we're just getting initial reports right now. So, uh, you know, we, we don't know exactly yet. I want to be careful about that. But it does appear uh, that there is a new, uh, uh, there is at least a reported new Russian uh, capability, military capability that involves space uh, that the Biden administration has asked to brief Congress about. Uh, this much has become public. We're waiting to see what exactly the details are, or how much they release publicly. Obviously, the timing of this new disclosure is very relevant to the political fight that we're already having here in Washington over the question of uh, support for Ukraine in its fight against Russia. Uh, and I would note that Russia has used a kind of nuclear saber rattling, nuclear blackmail, especially in the early months of the war in Ukraine, it proved to be a somewhat successful tactic in terms of uh, warning the United States and other Western allies to avoid too much escalation because they were afraid of uh, uh, poking uh, Russia too much and prompting a nuclear response. There was much made of the fact, for example, uh, that use of tactical nuclear weapons is, is, is in the Russian uh, military doctrine uh, when it comes to certain situations. And so uh, there had been a fear uh, of how Putin, who has not been uh, shy about using and deploying uh, kind of nuclear threats, uh, especially to, to force the West to back off uh, from its support for Ukraine, this new capability uh, would be a way of reasserting uh, that nuclear threat at a moment where uh, Putin may want to gain the advantage and gain the upper hand uh, in that conflict. And, you know, again, I just think that for 20 years, uh, we have often uh, dismissed or downplayed or underestimated uh, the level of animosity that Putin had toward the West and his willingness uh, to take measures that we once thought were Quite unthinkable. So I, I think it, it sounds like something significant that will affect both our politics and our national security. I have to explain that uh, for a moment there, I had a power outage and it took my computer out and I'm now uh, getting back into my, my computer. I've got the chat up, but I don't 
it doesn't have any messages that I can see on it anymore. You know what, Warren? Uh, I can I can pose the questions to you. We get that. Okay, uh, Janice is going to be able to ask the questions, and uh, I will repeat them. Then go ahead, Janice. Um, Ruth asks, can Trump do an end run around the policy that was part of the defense bill, preventing a president from unilaterally withdrawing from NATO? Well, this is a good question. Obviously, uh, uh, I think that you know, as I said before. Trump doesn't even need to uh, officially withdraw from NATO to undermine it. Here's here's a little anecdote, uh, you know, that uh, came up in the course of some reporting I, I'm doing right now uh, from someone who served in the Trump administration uh, as far back as the spring of 2017 when Donald Trump first came into office. Uh, this is exactly the line that he was already using on his staff, uh, you know, well, if uh, uh, this country in Europe, uh, this country in NATO uh, doesn't uh, uh, have a big enough defense budget, then, you know, let Russia come and get them. What do I care? Uh, we had an example that we reported in our last book about uh, Lithuania. Donald Trump was being uh, briefed by his staff on just what Article 5 self-defense means uh, in the NATO treaty. And he said, wait a minute, you're telling me that we should go to war on behalf of Lithuania? Are you kidding me? No way. Uh, no way am I doing that. And, you know, those were the private comments. By making comments like that publicly, as he did this last week, he's already undermined NATO in a way that is very, very significant. I can now see the chat and, uh, let me ask a question from Eric. I presume you haven't asked this already. I understand that Speaker Johnson wants a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Biden about foreign aid and that Biden is refusing. Can you please explain the politics on both sides of that issue? <laughs> uh, well, uh, you know, I think that uh, it's fair to conclude at this point, uh, if you're in the White House, that uh, the House Republicans are not on the level. Uh, Mike Johnson was against Ukraine aid, and then he was for Ukraine aid just the other day. He said, well, absolutely, uh, you know, I want to get this through. And then as soon as the Senate passed the bill, he said, oh, no, I don't think we're going to be bringing that to a floor vote, not anytime soon. Uh, so why would you expend the credibility and time of the president of the United States meeting with a man who cannot deliver on anything that he says. I just think right now, uh, uh, you know, these are this is a party and a relationship shaped by weakness and mutual distrust. And so um, they'd have to have a lot more concrete progress probably uh, before we get to the point of a meeting between the president and the speaker. Here's a lengthy message from Phil. He says, along the lines of your comments right now about Putin and his threats, Biden has been from the very beginning overly concerned about Putin's red lines and he's been constantly laid on getting Ukraine the kind of advanced weapons that they have needed. How do you feel about these delays? Have they put Ukraine in an impossible position of uh, fitting an endless war, fighting an endless war against a country that's three times its size? Well, look, I think that, um, you know, there's probably uh, a lot of second guessing and, you know, what might have been that, you uh, people will engage in, historians will look back on and hopefully give us a little bit more concrete or authoritative of an answer on, uh, was there a genuine moment in the uh, summer of uh, and fall of 2022 when it was clear that Ukraine had uh, not only survived but beaten back the initial assault on Kyiv? You know, was there a window of opportunity for them to make even bigger gains before Russia essentially dug into its defensive positions. There was a laundry list of different kinds of weapons and capabilities that uh, Biden and other NATO allies were reluctant to provide at that time. Eventually, they did go down the list and provide them everything from longer range uh, attack missiles to battle tanks to uh, um, even uh, uh, fighter jets. And, uh, you know, maybe that would have made a, a difference right now, right now. We are literally talking about ammunition. Uh, you know, the moment for that kind of offensive capability uh, has come and gone, uh, at least for the foreseeable future. This is a defensive war uh, that Ukraine will be fighting on its um, 
uh, very stalled front line in, in the east of Ukraine with Russia. Now there are other kinds of operations that the Ukrainians have been launching, some with great success uh, in the Black Sea, for example. I think they've taken out something like 20% uh, of the Black Sea fleet, which is quite remarkable when you consider that Ukraine actually doesn't even have a navy. Uh, you know, they are making kind of asymmetrical attacks on Crimea uh, that uh, uh, downgrade Russia's uh, capabilities to keep fighting the war, its logistics, its uh, supply, things like that. Um, but look, uh, you know, I always believed, unfortunately, that a kind of semi-frozen conflict somewhere in the east of Ukraine was, was a quite uh, foreseeable uh, consequence of uh, this invasion, that, that Putin would make gains, but that he would be unable to swallow up Ukraine in its entirety. Uh, and, you know, right now, again, the biggest destabilization in this conflict is the uncertainty over what's happening in the United States, in, in our U.S. Congress, and in our election. And I think this is kind of the political moment for the world writ large. Uh, I believe for a long time, the biggest geopolitical crisis in the world is the United States of America and what's happening in our own dysfunctional politics. And I think this kind of Ukraine debacle is, is just a little uh, uh, piece of that broader and, and very troublesome whole. I'm able to find one final question from Stuart, which I don't fully understand, but it gives us a chance to talk about the US Supreme Court, another institution that is uh, said to be, and I think demonstrably is, in some trouble. Uh, should Justice Sotomayor step down soon to avoid another RBG situation with Bader Ginsburg uh, if the Republicans win either both the White House and or the Senate in 2024? I don't understand that question. Justice Sotomayor was appointed by a Democrat, not a Republican. Right. No, I think that the, the point there, as far as I understand it, would be uh, that she should perhaps uh, step aside before Republicans come back to power, enabling a Democratic president. And oh, Democratic I see. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, to have her succeed. I, I'm not you. aware, by the way, uh, and perhaps the questioner is, of any particular urgency uh, uh, or health issues uh, involving Justice Sotomayor. And, you know, I think it's an important point. We've all seen what happened in the aftermath of uh, Justice Ginsburg deciding to hold on. Uh, uh, but at the same time, you know, the reality is that there is a 6-3 uh, conservative Republican majority on the Supreme Court right now. So uh, the balance of power is no longer hanging, uh, you know, up for grabs uh, in the way that it was uh, when Justice Ginsburg was in her later years on the court. Uh, for the foreseeable future, uh, that balance of power has been decided uh, in part by Mitch McConnell's extraordinary power grab uh, in the final months of the Obama presidency when he refused uh, to allow any consideration of or a vote on Obama's appointee uh, to the court. And that, you know, combined with Trump's uh, subsequent appointments, uh, you know, really radically changed the Supreme Court in a very short amount of time. Uh, and we're, we're just beginning to understand, I think, the contours of the changes that that conservative majority uh, is going to write upon uh, the, the American uh, uh, story. Uh, I do think it's going to be a long-term impact on the country, that court. And of course, you never know what the justices are going to do. Both Justice Kagan and Justice uh, Jackson, uh, to people's astonishment, uh, didn't seem to take very seriously the idea that uh, Trump might have uh, uh, been involved in an insurrection when they had an opportunity to uh, uh, take that matter up. There's some thought that uh, that uh, part of the case or one of the cases against him might be uh, unanimously uh, rejected by the court. Um, very su quickly, Susan Glaser, at the, at, the, at the end of every program, we always asked, is there anything positive you can say? Is there, is there something you can say that make a, it'll make everybody feel good as they go to dinner or go to bed? You know, you know, you're in trouble when that's the stumper of the question and everything else <laughs> uh, is easy to answer. Uh, look, you know, it's Valentine's Day and uh, it's amazing to me uh, that so many people would would spend a little bit of their time 
uh, you know, when they should be thinking about their loved ones and their family and their their friends thinking about their country. And, you know, election years are stressful and divisive and all of those things. Uh, and yet, you know, every generation has to make it their own. Uh, you know, it's also a time for standing up. And, uh, you know, I, I I wouldn't discount that. Uh, you know, I, I think that Americans uh, have the capacity still to surprise us in a good way. So I'm going to, I'm going to think in that positive frame of mind uh, uh, to go into the rest of the evening. And thank you for these fantastic questions uh, and for sharing your time with me tonight. Well, thank you for doing this. And I think a lot of people will uh, do a lot to hear from you and uh, they'll do it again. And, and uh, uh, that's why we have such an alert and ready and large audience uh, tonight. Susan Glasser, once again, writer for The New, York, uh, for the New Yorker. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. Delighted to be with you all. Thank you. Okay, next week, February 21st, 5 to 6 p.m., uh, the foremost election and voting, and voting rights expert, Rick Hassan, professor at uh, UCLA. Uh, he'll be on with my good friend, Larry Mantle. And they'll be talking about a real right to vote, how a constitutional amendment can safeguard American democracy. Thanks for joining us. Have a good night uh, and a good week and happy Valentine's Day. <laughs>